Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial of our channel Team Square. We are getting started with our brand new playlist on ISDQB foundation level certification sample questions discussion. However, we do have an existing playlist on 3.1. I would not say that that gets retired. The reason is uh, for 3.1, uh, we have added some more new topics to make 4.0. So the sample paper discussions of 3.1 is still going to be very much valid for getting all sort of tips and tricks if you're required to prepare well for your certification. So it's not that this is the only playlist what you should be watching in order to prepare well for 4.0. You can still watch the other playlist 3.1, which would have a lot of tips and tricks for you to crack this examination. However, just to not confuse people who might be interested to see only 4.0 or saying that, oh, this is an outdated playlist, we would like to create it as a separate playlist, but just wanted to let this know in the beginning of the uh, session just to make sure that you don't miss out the best from this channel. So getting started with this, of course, uh, we have four mock papers to discuss here. So this is going to be a little long playlist and having a lot of questions being discussed. So make sure that you listen to all the playlist videos. However, uh, there will be four sets talking about A, B, C, D. We are getting started with the set A today and uh, we'll continue till all the 40 questions gets completed and then we'll pick up B, C and D so far and so on. So for today, we are getting started with the first set that is A and picking up the very first question of the day and this particular playlist. So let's have a look. The very first question is saying which of the following statement describes a valid test objective. Now, remember, those basic principles what you probably know already if not i'm just gonna repeat it once again here whenever you have the context very clear in the question provided to you then make sure you stop there you make a pause and start recalling what you know about about it right for example if you say you have got the test objectives being asked to you then you should start recalling that what are the common test objectives of testing what i remember during the examination, right? So say I may talk about finding failures or finding defects, then reviewing work products, reducing the level of risk, making sure the non-functional, functional, functional uh, contractual, regulatory, all those requirements are in my bucket. So just recall everything, right? That would help your job to get to the right answer quickly. At the same time, being confident with the right answer would be very important here because getting an answer not necessarily means you got the right answer. So this recollection will help you to conclude with the right answer actually. So let's start looking at each of these options and try to understand what did they mean and how we can conclude them. So option A says to prove that there are no unfixed defects in the system under test. I think this statement completely goes in conflict with the principle number one. Testing shows presence of defect but not their absence. Testing is not a process or activity which can lead to the defect-free product. In fact, testing shows the presence of defect if you test it, but testing is never ending journey. It can continue forever. And that's where it basically becomes a challenge, correct? So I cannot make a statement at any point of time that after performing the required tests, there'll be no unfixed defects. Now unfixed defects, another problem is that it's not necessary that you resolve every single defect what you find. Sometimes we leave few of the defects open uh, just because there might be an extra cost involved or maybe we don't have a workaround for it right now. So you may have left them deferred. And that's where we cannot make that statement further that there are no undefect, unfixed defects. Okay, so let's look at option B. To prove that there will be no failures after the implementation of the system into production. Again, conflicting with the principle one itself, that as I cannot assure you that I'm making a defect-free product, there might be some defects which we may miss out or probably leak to the production. So there is no such promises made by the testing that I'm assuring you a defect-free product and thus there will be no failures in the production. It's more of like we will be ready to make sure that how to resolve it, the team will be available as we go live, but we just make sure that the testing, what we'll be performing will not result into a critical failure. However, some major or minor things may be there, but however, with testing, we are one way assuring that we have tested it well and there might not be any failure. That's a prediction, but cannot be a hard and bold statement. 
Okay, so we cannot make a hard and bold statement that there will be no failures in production. But however, we promise them that we have tested it well. Look at the option C. It says to reduce the risk level of the test object and to build confidence in the quality level. That's really one of our common objectives to be performed as a part of the testing to make sure that when it comes to performing testing for any application, the one of the objective is to identify the risk and of course mitigate them by conducting the required amount of testing. And again, it's not necessary to say that you can really mitigate every single thing. So you may just be uh, reducing the existing level of the risk. So it looks great, but still let's confirm with option D. Option D says to verify that there are no untested combination of inputs. Uh, that's complex with that conflicts with our principle number two. Exhaustive testing is impossible, which is where we say that trying out with every possible combinations of the input is called as exhaustive testing and testing that is impossible, right? So that's where D gets ruled out and put together. The right answer here for this particular question is C, to reduce the risk level of the test object and to build confidence in the quality of the level. Let's quickly look on to the next question here, the question number two, and try understanding what exactly they're trying to convey us. The question number two here is talking about the next one, that is, which of the following options shows example of test activities that contributes to success? Again, we have already learned about this and why testing is important, and we told you how exactly testing participates throughout the life cycle to make sure that they have equal contribution towards the success. Just testing the system at dynamic level does not mean that you can really find all the defects, but we contribute to overall success by participating early in the life cycle as well. So let's look at each of these options. Option A says having testers involved during various software development life cycle activities will help to def detect defects in the work product. That's certainly one of our key participation throughout the life cycle to make sure that we start reviewing the work products or having at least some kind of corresponding test activity to those of the development activity to make sure that we detect defects as soon as per possible in the life cycle and make most out of this particular process. So it's not just limited to conducting dynamic testing, but we are good at performing static testing as well. Also, let's talk about option B. It says uh, testers try not to disturb the developers while coding so that developers write better code. Now that looks like a very funny statement because uh, however, testers are not someone who are responsible to disturb somebody, but more of like uh, they are saying against the question. The question itself is saying, how do we contribute to the success? That is by not dis disturbing the developers. Of course, it's not called a disturbance. It's more of like collaboration. So yes, you can participate at the code review and certainly engage with them, collaborate with them, to understand what the code is all about, or at the same time, sharing testing perspective to them would make more sense. That means they would be aware of what kind of uh, test cases we are writing and how exactly that would, you know, hit their code and they can prevent defects to happen. Additionally, if you are writing automation scripts, then collaborating with developers will help you to have the right attributes and properties for these objects that we can go ahead and identify this during the automation. So certainly we do not talk about disturbing the developer and it's more about collaboration. So this is not the right option. That's not how we contribute to success. C, uh, testers collaborating with end users help to improve the quality of defects reporting during component integration and system testing. I think again, this looks like a little silly option uh, during component and during integration testing, it's more about giving confidence to the development team, that is the testing and development team put together uh, to gain the internal confidence that the system is working fine. And I don't think there's any role of end user being played at this point of time. If you say acceptance testing, we understand that yes, uh, at acceptance testing, having end users being participated would give us a great confidence and coverage measurement. But uh, when it comes to component testing and integration testing, this is not something which is meaningful. So we can rule out option C as well. Let's look at the next one and that's option D. Certified testers will design more better test cases than non-certified testers. Remember one thing, 
But if you're writing an examination about a body, it doesn't mean that their relevant statements are always the right answer. Okay, so it's not that certified testers will write better test cases than non-certified testers. It's, it's just that it is a kind of distraction, a kind of de deviation created in the options that you sometimes start thinking, should I consider this? No, not at all. Because uh, it, certification is just a recognition to what you do. It's, it's not really kind of like going to create any kind of difference in the overall success of the project, right? Your experience, your, ma your experience matters. The way you have been testing this product in the past, how much you know about the product, all these matters as you know you get into that. So it's very important to say your experience would be more playing the better role than that of the certification when it comes to the overall success of the product and how testing contributes to it. So concluding with that, the right answer here is the option A, having testers involved during various software development lifecycle activities will help to defect, detect defects in the work products. So that makes it simple and easy to understand. Now let's look at the next question. That's question number three. And question number three is talking about another one, which is related to principles of testing. You have been assigned as a tester to a team producing a new system incrementally. You have noticed that no changes have been made to the existing regression test cases for several iterations and no new regression defects were identified. Just hold on here. If you read this line, the first thing what should come to your mind is, are we talking about tests wear out? Because they are saying clearly that the test suite, which is regression test suite, have not been revised. And at the same time, in past few executions, you have not resulted in identification of any defects. So that clearly signifies that my tests are, you know, being kind of updated. And I think there's a time to look forward to revise the test cases. But let's continue the question with some context in your mind that what you are thinking about. It says that, uh, of course, no regression defects have been identified. So your manager is happy, but you are not. Which testing principle explains your skepticism? I think that makes it pretty clear that our skepticism was equally right with that of the principle. So the question was about the principles of testing. And they were just trying to ask you, no matter, you know, manager feels happy or not. Remember, sometimes ISTQB creates a little bit of diversion and simple scenarios as well. Okay, they just try to create it in such a way that you start thinking, oh, if my manager is happy, why should I be worried about? It? No way. Here we are not talking about who is happy, who is not happy. The context is, what is your skepticism about this? Okay, for that, they just created a statement. So never get carried away by if my manager is happy, why should I be worried about? No, There's, the answer does not say that, right? They're just talking about which of the principle is talking about it. And we have straightforward four options. That is test wear out, absence of error fallacy, defects clustered together, and D, exhaustive testing is impossible. And I think we already have the answer with us. The right answer here is A, tests wear out. And the other options are right other principles. Absence of error fallacy talks about requirement. And if we say defects clustered together, that talks about accumulation of defects. And exhaustive testing is impossible is talking about trying out with all possible combination of inputs and testing the system, which is absolutely not correct. So for today, we'll just keep it to these three questions. We'll come back and talk about more questions one after the other. So. That's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.